Gulliver's Travels into Several Remote Nations of the World by Jonathan Swift. The Publisher to the Reader, as given in the original edition. The author of these travels, Mr. Lemuel Gulliver, is my ancient and intimate friend. There is likewise some relation between us on the mother's side. About three years ago, Mr. Gulliver, growing weary of the concourse, of curious people coming to him at his house in Redriff, made a small purchase of land with a convenient house near Newark in Nottinghamshire, his native country, where he now lives retired, yet in good esteem among his neighbors. Although Mr. Gulliver was born in Nottinghamshire, where his father dwelt, yet have I heard him say his family came from Oxfordshire, to confirm which I have observed in the churchyard at Banbury in that country several tombs and monuments of the Gullivers. Before he quitted Redriff, he left the custody of the following papers in my hands, with the liberty to dispose of them as I should think fit. I have carefully perused them three times. The style is very plain and simple, and the only fault I find is that the author, after the manner of travelers, is a little too circumstantial. There is an air of truth apparent through the whole, and indeed the author was so distinguished for his veracity that it became a sort of proverb among his neighbors at Redriff, when any one affirmed a thing to say that it was true as if Mr. Gulliver had spoken it. By the advice of several worthy persons, to whom, with the author's permission, I have communicated these papers, I now venture to send them into the world hoping they may be, at least for some time, a better entertainment of our young noblemen than the common scribbles of politics and party. This volume would have been at least twice as large if I had not made bold to strike out innumerable passages relating to the winds and tides, as well as to the variations and bearings in the several voyages, together with the minute descriptions of the management of the ship in storms, in the style of sailors, Likewise, the account of longitudes and latitudes, wherein I have reason to apprehend that Mr. Gulliver may be a little dissatisfied, but I was resolved to fit the work as much as possible to the general capacity of readers. However, if my own ignorance in sea affairs shall have led me to commit some mistakes, I alone am answerable for them. And if any other traveler hath a curiosity to see the whole work at large, as it came from the hands of the author, I will be ready to gratify him. As for any further particulars relating to the author, the reader will receive satisfaction from the first pages of the book. Richard Simpson A letter from Captain Gulliver to his cousin Simpson Written in the year 1727 I hope you will be ready to own publicly whether you shall be called to it that by your great and frequent urgency you prevailed on me to publish a very loose and uncorrect account of my travels, with directions to hire some young gentleman of either university to put them in order and correct the style, as my dear cousin Dampier did by my advice in his book called A Voyage Around the World. But I do not remember I gave you power to consent that anything should be omitted, and much less that anything should be inserted. Therefore, as to the latter, I do here renounce everything of that kind, particularly a paragraph about Her Majesty Queen Anne, of most pious and glorious memory, although I did reverence and esteem her more than any of the human species. But you, or your interpolator, ought to have considered that it was not my inclination so was it not decent to praise any animal of our composition before my master Huminen? And besides, the fact was altogether false, for to my knowledge being in England during some part of Her Majesty's reign, she did govern by a chief minister, nay, even by two successively, the first whereof was the Lord of Galdafin, and the second the Lord of Oxford, so that you have made me say the thing that was not, Likewise, in the account of the Academy of the Projectors, on several passages of my discourse to my master Hunan, you have either omitted some material circumstances, or minced and changed them in such a manner that I do hardly know my own work. When I formerly hinted to you something in this letter, you were pleased to answer that you were afraid of giving offense, that people in power were very watchful over the press, 
and apt not only to interpret but to punish everything that looked like an innuendo, as I think you call it. But pray, how could that, which I spoke so many years ago, and in about 5,000 leagues distance, in another reign, be applied to any of the yahoos who are now said to govern the herd, especially at a time when I little thought or feared the unhappiness of living under them? Have not I the most reason to complain when I see these very yahoos carried by Hunanans in a vehicle, as if they were brutes, and those the rational creatures? And indeed, to avoid so monstrous and detestable a sight was one principal motive of my retirement hither. Thus much I thought proper to tell you in a, your relation to yourself, and to trust I reposed in you. I do in the next place complain of my own great want of judgment, in being prevailed upon by the entreaties and false reasoning of you and some others, very much against my own opinion to suffer my travels to be published. Pray bring to your mind how often I desired you to consider when you insisted on the motive of the public good, that the yahoos were a species of animals utterly incapable of amendment by precept or example. And so it has proved, for instead of seeing a full stop put to all abuses and corruptions, at least in this little island, I had reason to expect, Behold, after above six months' warning, I cannot learn that my book has produced one single effect according to my intentions. I desired you would let me know by a letter when party and faction were extinguished, judges learned and upright, pleaders honest and modest, with some tincture of common sense, and Smithfield blazing with pyramids of law books. The young nobility's education entirely changed. The physicians banished, the female yahoos abounding in virtue, honor and truth and good sense, courts and levies of great ministers, thoroughly weeded and swept, wit, merit, and lean, learning rewarded, all disgracers of the press in the prose and verse condemned to eat nothing but their own cotton, and quench their thirst for their own ink. These and thousand other reformations I firmly counted upon your, by your encouragement, as indeed they were plainly deductible from the precepts delivered in my book, and it must be owned that seven months were a sufficient time to correct every vice and folly to which yahoos are subject, if their natures had been capable of the least disposition of, to virtue or wisdom. Yet so far have you been from answering my expectation in any of your letters, that on the contrary you are loading your, our carrier every week with libels and keys and reflections and memoirs and second parts, wherein I see myself accused of reflecting upon great state folk of degrading human nature, for so they have still the confidence and style of it, and of abusing the female sex. I find likewise that the writers of those bundles have not agreed among themselves for some of them will not allow me to be the author of my own travels, and others make me author of books to which I am wholly a stranger. I find likewise that your printer has been so careless as to confound the times and mistake the dates of my several voyages and returns, neither assigning the true year nor the true month nor day of the month, and I hear the original manuscript is all destroyed since the publication of my book. Neither have I any copy left. However, I have sent you some corrections, which you may insert, if ever there should be a second edition, and yet I cannot stand to them, but shall leave that matter to my judicious and candid readers, to adjust it as they please. I hear some of our sea yahoos find fault with my sea language, as not proper in many parts, nor now in use. I cannot help it. In my first voyages, while I was young, I was instructed by the oldest mariner and learned to speak as they did. But I have since found that the sea yahoos were apt, like the land ones, to become newfangled in their words, which the latter change every year, insomuch as I remember upon each return to my own country, their old dialect was so altered that I could hardly understand the new. And I observe when any yahoo comes from London out of curiosity to visit me at my house, we neither of us are able to deliver our conceptions in a manner intelligible to the other. If the censure of the yahoos 
could any way affect me. I should have great reason to complain that some of them are so bold as to think my book of travels a mere fiction out of mine own brain, and have gone so far as to drop hints that the Hunans and Yahoos have no more existence than the inhabitants of Utopia. Indeed, I must confess that as to the people of Lilliput Brobdingnag, for so the word should have been spelt, and not in nor erroneously Brobdingnag, and Laputa, I have never yet heard of any Yahoo so presumptuous as to dispute their being, or the facts I have related concerning them, because the truth immediately strikes every reader with conviction. And is there less probability in my account of the Hunans or the Yahoos? When it is manifest as to the latter, there are so many thousands, even in this country, who only differ from their brother brutes in Humanland, because they use a sort of jabber and do not go naked. I wrote for their amendment, and not for their approbation. The united praise of the whole race could be of less consequence to me than the neighing of two degenerate Hinnanans. I kept in my stable. Because of these, degenerate as they are, I still improve in some virtues without any mixture of vice. Do these miserable animals presume to think that I am so denigrated as to defend my veracity? Yahoo as I am! It is well known through all human land that by the instructions and examples of my illustrious master, I was able in the compass of two years, although I confess with the utmost difficulty, to remove that infernal habit of lying, shuffling, deceiving, and equivocating, so deeply rooted in the very souls of all my species, especially the Europeans. I have other complaints to make upon this vexatious occasion, but I forbear troubling myself or you any further. I must freely convince, confess that since my last return, some corruptions of my Yahoo nature have been revived in me by conversing with a few of your species, and particularly those of my own family, by an unavoidable necessity. However, I should have never attempted so absurd a project as that of reforming the Yahoo race in this kingdom, but I have now done with all visionary schemes forever. April 2nd, 1727 Part 1. A Journey to Lilliput Chapter 1. The author gives some account of himself and family, his first inducements to travel. He is shipwrecked and swims for his life, gets safe on shore in the country of Lilliput, is made a prisoner and carried up the country. My father had a small estate in Nottinghamshire. I was the third of five sons. He sent me to Emmanuel College in Cambridge at 14 years old, where I resided three years and applied myself close to my studies. But the charge of maintaining me, although I had a very scanty allowance, being too great for a narrow fortune, I was bound apprentice to Mr. James Bates, an eminent surgeon in London, with whom I continued four years, my father now and then sending me small sums of money I laid them out in learning navigation and other parts of the mathematics useful to those who intend to travel, as I always believed it would be some time or other my fortune to do. When I left Mr. Bates, I went down to my father, where, by the assistance of him and my uncle John, and some other relations, I got forty pounds and a promise of thirty pounds a year to maintain me at Leyden. There I studied physic two years and seven months, knowing it would be useful in long voyages. Soon after my return from Leyden, I was recommended by my good master, Mr. Bates, to be surgeon to the Swallow Captain, Abraham Pannell, commander, with whom I continued three years and a half, making a voyage or two into the Levant and some other parts. When I came back, I resolved to settle in London, to which Mr. Bates, my master, encouraged me, and by him I was recommended to several patients. I took part of a small house in the old Jewry, and being advised to alter my condition, I married Miss Mary Burton, second daughter to Mr. Edmund Burton Hosier, in Newgate Street, with whom I received 400 pounds for a portion. 
but my good master Bates, dying in two years after, and I having few friends, my business began to fail, for my conscience would not suffer me to imitate the bad practice of too many among my brethren. Having therefore consulted with my wife and some of my acquaintance, I determined to go to sea again. I was surgeon successfully, successively in two ships and made several voyages for six years to the East and West Indies, by which I got some addition to my fortune. My hours of leisure I spent in reading the best authors, ancient and modern, being always provided with a good number of books and when I was ashore in observing the manners and dispositions of the people, as well as learning their language, wherein I had a great facility by strength of my memory. The last of these voyages, not proving very fortunate, I grew weary of the sea and intended to stay at home with my wife and family. I removed from the old Jewry to Fetter Lane and from thence to Wapping, hoping to get business among the sailors but it would not turn to account. After three years' expectation that things would mend, I accepted an advantageous offer from Captain William Pritchard, master of the Antelope, who was making a voyage to the South Sea. We set sail from Bristol, May 4, 1699, and our voyage was at first very prosperous. It would not be proper, for some reasons, to trouble the reader with the particulars of our adventures in those seas, let it to suffice to inform him that in our passage from thence to the East Indies, we were driven by a violent storm to the northwest of Van Diemen's Land. By an observation, we found ourselves in the latitude of 30 degrees, two minutes south. Twelve of our crew were dead by immoderate labor or ill food, and the rest were in a very weak condition. On the 5th of November, which was the beginning of summer in those parts, the weather being very hazy, the seamen spied a rock within half a cable's length of the ship, but the wind was so strong that we were driven directly upon it and immediately split. Six of the crew, of whom I was one, having let down the boat into the sea, made a shift to get clear of the ship and the rock. We rowed, by my computation, about three leagues, till we were able to work no longer, being already spent with labor while we were in the ship. We therefore trusted ourselves to the mercy of the waves, and about half an hour the boat was overset by a sudden flurry from the north. What became of my companions in the boat, as well as those who escaped on the rock, or were left in the vis vessel, I cannot tell, but conclude they were all lost. For my own part, I swam as fortune directed me, and was pushed forward by wind and tide. I often let my legs drop and could feel no bottom, but when I was almost gone and able to struggle no longer, I found myself within my depth, and by this time the storms had was much abated. The declivity was so small that I walked near a mile before I got to the shore, which I conjectured was about eight o'clock in the evening. I then advanced forward near half a mile, but could not discover any sign of houses or inhabitants. At least I was in so weak a condition that I did not observe them. I was extremely tired, and with that and the heat of the weather, and about half a pint of brandy that I drank as I left the ship, I found myself much inclined to sleep. I lay down on the grass, which was very short and soft where I slept sounder than ever I remembered to have done in the, my life, and as I reckoned, about nine hours, for when I awaked it was just daylight. I attempted to rise, but was not able to stir, for as I happened to lie on my back, I found my arms and legs were strongly fastened on each side to the ground, and my hair, which was long and thick, tied down in the same manner. I likewise felt several slender ligatures across my body, from my armpits to my thighs. I could only look upwards. The sun began to grow hot, and the light offended my eyes. I heard a confused noise about me, but in the posture I lay could see nothing except the sky. In a little time I felt something alive moving on my left leg, which advancing gently forward over my breast, came almost up to my chin 
when bending my eyes downward as much as I could. I perceived it to be a human creature, not six inches high, with a bow and arrow in his hands and a quiver on his back. In the meantime, I felt at least forty more of the same kind, as I conjectured, following the first. I was in the utmost astonishment and roared so loud that they all ran back in a fright, and some of them, as I was afterwards told, got hurt in the falls they got by leaping from my sides upon the ground. However, they soon returned, and one of them, who ventured so far as to get a full sight of my face, lifting up his hands and eyes by way of admiration, cried out in a shrill but distinct voice, Hanking Dougal! The others repeated the same words several times, but then I knew not what they meant. I lay all this while, as the reader may believe in great uneasiness. At length, struggling to get loose, I had the fortune to break the strings and wrench out the pegs that fastened my left arm to the ground, for by lifting it up to my face I discovered the methods they had taken to bind me, and at the same time with a violent pull, which gave me excessive pain, I a little loosened the strings that tied down my hair, on the left side, so that I was able to turn my head about two inches. But the creatures ran off a second time, before I could seize them. Whereupon there was a great shout in a very shrill accent, and after it ceased I heard one of them cry aloud, Tologophonic! When in an instant I felt above a hundred arrows discharged on my left hand, which pricked me like so many needles and besides they shot another flight into the air, as we do bombs in Europe, whereof many, I suppose, fell on my body, though I felt them not, and some on my face, which I immediately covered with my left hand. When this shower of arrows was over, I felt a groaning with grief and pain, and then striving again to get loose, they discharged another volley larger than the first and some of them attempted with spears to stick me in the sides. But by good luck I had on a buff jerkin, which they could not pierce. I thought it the most prudent method to lie still, and my design was to continue so till night, when my left hand, being already loose, I could easily free myself. As for the inhabitants, I had reason to believe I might be a match for the greatest army they could bring against me if they were all of the same size with him that I saw. But fortune disposed me otherwise of me. When the people observed I was quiet, they discharged no more arrows. But, by the noise I heard, I knew their numbers increased. And about four yards from me, over against my right ear, I heard a knocking for above an hour. Like that of people at work, when turning my head that way, as well as the pegs and strings would permit me, I saw a stage erected about a foot and a half from the ground, capable of holding four of the inhabitants, with two or three ladders to mount it, from whence one of them, who seemed to be a person of quality, made me a long speech, whereof I understood not one syllable. But I should have mentioned, but that before the principal person began his oration, he cried out three words. Longrel Duha San. These words and the former were afterwards repeated and explained to me. Whereupon immediately about fifty of the inhabitants came and cut the strings that fastened the left side of my head, which gave me the liberty of turning to the right, and of observing the person and gesture of him that was to speak. He appeared to be of a middle age and taller than any of the other three who attended him whereof one was a page that held up his train, and seemed to be somewhat longer than my middle finger. The other two stood one on each side to support him. He acted every part an orator, and I could observe many periods of threatenings and others of promises, pity, and kindness. I answered in a few words, but in the most submissive manner, lifting my left hand and both my eyes to the sun, as calling him for a witness and being almost famished with hunger, having not eaten a morsel for some hours before I left the ship, I found the demands of nature so strong upon me 
that I could not forbear showing my impatience, perhaps against the strict rules of decency, by putting my finger frequently to my mouth to signify that I wanted food. The Hergo, for as they call a great lord, as I afterwards learned, understood me very well. He descended from the stage and commanded that several ladders should be applied to my sides, which above a hundred of the inhabitants mounted and walked towards my mouth, laden with baskets full of meat, which had been provided and sent thither by the king's orders upon the first intelligence he received of me. I observed there was the flesh of several animals, but could not distinguish them by taste. There were shoulders, legs, and loins, shaped like those of mutton, and very well dressed, but smaller than the wings of a lark. I ate them by two or three at a mouthful, and took three loaves at a time, about the bigness of musket bullets. They supplied me as fast as they could, showing a thousand marks of wonder and astonishment at my bulk and appetite. I then made another sign that I wanted drink. They found by my meeting, eating that a small quantity would not suffice me, and being a most ingenious people, they slung up with great dexterity one of their largest hogsheads, then rolled it towards my hand and beat out the top. I drank it off at a draught, which I might well do, for it did not hold half a pint, and tasted like a small wine of burgundy, but much more delicious. They brought me a second hogshead, which I drank in the same manner, and made signs for more, but they had none to give me. When I had performed these wonders, they shouted for joy and danced upon my breast, repeating several times as they did, Hiken Dougal! They made me a sign that I should throw down the two hogsheads, but first warning the people below to stand out of the way, crying aloud, and then when they saw the vessels in the air, there was a universal shout of Heikendugel. I confess I was often tempted while they were passing backwards and forwards on my body to seize forty or fifty of the first that came within my reach and dash them against the ground. But the remembrance of what I had felt, which probably might not be the worst they could do, and the promise of honor I had made them, for so I interpreted my submissive behavior, soon drove these imaginations. Besides, I now considered myself as bound by the laws of hospitality to a people who had treated me with much expense and magnificence. However, in my thoughts, I could not sufficiently wonder at the intrepidity of these diminutive mortals who durst venture to the mount and walk upon my body while one of my hands was at liberty without trembling at the very sight of so prodigious a creature as I must appear to them. After some time, when they observed that I made no more demands for meat, there appeared before me a person of high rank from his imperial majesty. His excellency, having mounted on the small of my right leg, advanced forwards up to my face, with about a dozen of his retinue and producing his credentials under the signet royal, which he applied close to my eyes, spoke about ten minutes, without any signs of anger, but with a kind of determinate resolution, often pointing forwards, which, as I afterwards found, was towards the capital city, about half a mile distance, whither it was agreed by his majesty in council that I must be conveyed. I answered in few words, but to no purpose, and made a sign with my hand that was loose, putting it to the other, but over his excellency's head for fear of hurting him or his train, and then to my own head and body to signify that I desired my liberty. It appeared that he understood me well enough, for he shook his head by way of disapprobation, and held his hand in a posture to show that I must be carried as a prisoner. However, he made other signs to let me understand that I should have meat and drink enough and very good treatment. Whereupon I once more thought of attempting to break my bonds. But again, when I felt the smart of their arrows upon my face and hands, 
which were all in blisters, and many of the darts still sticking in them, and observing likewise that the number of my enemies increased, I gave tokens to let them know that they might do with me what they pleased. Upon this the Hergo and his train withdrew, with much civility and cheerful countenances. Soon after I heard a general shout, with frequent repetitions, of the word peplum, salon, and I felt great numbers of people on my left side relaxing the cords to such a degree that I was able to turn upon my right, and to ease myself with making water, which I very plentifully did, to the great astonishment of the people, who conjecturing by my motion what I was going to do, immediately opened to the right and left on that side to avoid the torrent, which fell with such noise and violence from me. But before this they had daubed my face and both my hands with a sort of ointment, very pleasant to the smell, which in a few minutes removed all the smart of their arrows. These circumstances, added to the refreshment I had received by their victuals and drink, which were very nourishing, disposed me to sleep. I slept about eight hours, as I was afterwards assured it was no wonder for the physicians by the emperor's order had mingled a sleepy potion in the hogshead wine. It seems that upon the first moment I was discovered sleeping on the ground after my landing, the emperor had early notice of it by an express, and determined in council that I should be tied in the manner I have related, which was done in the night while I slept. Then plenty of meat and drink should be sent to me, and a machine prepared to carry me to the capital city. This resolution perhaps may appear very bold and dangerous, and I am confident would not be imitated by any prince in Europe on the like occasion. However, in my opinion, it was extremely prudent as well as generous, for supposing these people had endeavored to kill me with their spears and arrows while I was asleep, I should certainly have awaked with the first sense of smart which might so far have roused my rage and strength as to enable me to break the strings, wherewith I was tied, after which, as they were not able to make resistance, so they could expect no mercy. These people are most excellent mathematicians, and arrive to a great perfection in mechanics, by the countenance and encouragement of the emperor, who is a renowned patron of learning. This prince, has several machines fixed on wheels for the carriage of trees and other great weights. He often builds his largest men of war, whereof some are nine feet long in woods where the timber grows, and has them carried on these engines three or four hundred yards to the sea. Five hundred carpenters and engineers were immediately set at work to prepare the greatest engine they had. It was a frame of wood raised three inches from the ground, upon seven feet long and four wide, moving upon twenty-two wheels. The shout I heard was upon the arrival of this engine, which it seems set out in four hours after my landing. It was brought parallel to me as I lay, but the principal difficulty was to raise and place me in this vehicle. Eighty poles, each one foot high, were erected for this purpose, and very strong cords of the bigness of a pack thread were fastened by hooks to many bandages, which the workmen had girt around my neck, my hands, my body, and my legs. Nine hundred of the strongest men were employed to draw up these cords, by many pulleys fastened on the poles, and thus in less than three hours I was raised and slung into the engine, and there tied fast. All this I was told, for while the operation was performing, I lay in a profound sleep, by the force of the sporiferous medicine infused into my liquor. Fifteen hundred of the emperor's largest horses, each about four inches and a half high, were employed to draw me towards the metropolis, which, as I said, was half a mile distant. About four hours after we began our journey, I awaked by a very ridiculous accident, for the carriage, being stopped a while to adjust something that was out of order, 
Two or three of the young natives had curiosity to see how I looked when I was asleep. They climbed up into the engine and advancing very softly to my face. One of them, an officer in the guards, put the sharp end of his half pike a good way up into my left nostril, which tickled my nose like a straw and made me sneeze violently, whereupon they stole off unperceived. It was three weeks before I knew the cause of my waking, so suddenly we made a long march with the remaining part of the day, and rested at night with five hundred guards on each side of me, half with torches and half with bows and arrows, ready to shoot me should I offer to stir. The next morning at sunrise we continued our march and arrived within two hundred yards of the city gates about noon. The emperor and his court came out to meet us, but his great officers would by no means suffer his majesty to endanger his person by mounting on my body. At the place where the carriage stopped, there stood an ancient temple, esteemed to be the largest in the whole kingdom, which having been polluted some years before by an unnatural murder, was according to the zeal of these people, looked upon as profane and therefore had been applied to common use, and all the ornaments and furniture carried away. In this edifice it was determined I should lodge. The great gate fronting to the north was about four feet high, and almost two feet wide, through which I could easily creep. On each side of the gate was a small window, not above six inches from the ground. Into that, on the left side, the king's smith, conveyed fourscore and eleven chains, like those that hang to a lady's watch in Europe, and almost as large, which were locked to my left leg, with six and thirty padlocks. Over against this temple, on the other side of the great highway, at twenty feet distant, there was a turret at least five feet high. Then the emperor ascended, with many principal lords of his court to have an opportunity of viewing me, as I was told, for I could not see them. It was reckoned that above a hundred thousand inhabitants came out of the town upon the same errand, and in spite of my guards, I believe there could not be fewer than ten thousand at several times, who mounted my body by help of ladders. But a proclamation was soon issued to forbid it upon pain of death, when the workmen found it was impossible for me to break loose, they cut all the strings that bound me, whereupon I rose up with a melancholy, a dis with as melancholy a disposition as ever I had in my life. But the noise and astonishment of the people at seeing me rise and walk are not to be expressed. The chains that held my left leg were about two yards long and gave me not only the liberty of walking backwards and forwards in a semicircle, but being fixed within four inches of the gate allowed me to creep in and lie at my full length in the temple. Mm -hmm.